We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. It may be the most important question you will ever ask. In fact, it might be the most important question of this entire apologetic series that we've been in over the past several weeks. And if you've been with us, you may be saying, wait a minute, this question is more important than is there a God? This question is more important than if God allows evil and suffering, then how can he exist? This, prob- this question is more important than did Jesus rise from the dead? This question is more important than was Jesus virgin born? This question is more important than is he coming again? This question is more important than if Jesus is the only way unto salvation. This question is more important than all of those, yes. And here is why. The way we answer this question determines how we answer every other question. Why should I trust the Bible? Why should I trust or why should I believe the Bible? How, when you open your Bibles this morning, and we're going to look at a lot of verses of Scripture today, but I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16, as we are going to seek to answer this question this morning. And when I say answer the question, many of you that are listening today, whether you're in person or you're joining us via live stream this morning, this is a question that maybe you already know that you do trust the Bible. But I'm not just asking you, do you trust the Bible? I'm asking you, why do you trust the Bible? So this morning, instead of um, just giving some platitudes, I want to pretend that you are in an evangelistic or an apologetics conversation with someone, and they ask you this question, why do you believe the Bible, or why do you trust the Bible? And you are now placed on the hot seat, and you have to give an answer for the hope that you profess in God's Word. How would you answer this question? Why do I trust the Bible? Now, Obviously, uh, I'm going to guess, in fact, I'd like for you just right now, if you either write them down or answer these in your mind, right now, if you had to give an answer, you were put on the spot and you had to give an answer, how would you answer that question? What would be your first initial response as to why you trust the Bible? Most people answer that question the wrong way. Even Christian people answer that question the wrong way. In fact, there are two varieties of answers to that question that will come up most of the time when people are asked why they trust the Bible. And the first, will, the first common answer will sound something like this. Well, that's how I was raised. Or that's how I was brought up. Or because mama and daddy took me to church. Or because my grandmother had faith. And they'll answer and they'll say, well, that's just how I came up or how I was brought up. Well, I want you to think with me for just a moment as to why that's an insufficient answer. In fact, why that's actually a terrible answer for why you trust the Bible. Now, let me give a caveat to that. If you were blessed to have people that brought you to church growing up, you were blessed to have people that the Word of God was a center point of your family and your life, then I'm not making light of that. What I'm making light of is you giving a wrong answer to the question. The reason that you trust the Bible is not because it was how you were brought up, or I hope that's not the reason that you trust the Bible. You say, well, what's wrong with that? You tell me what's wrong with that. That would mean that anyone who was brought up any way could give you that for the reason for why they trust anything. Any faith, any religion, any far-fetched story. It's what my mama told me. It's what my granddaddy told me. It's an insufficient answer. And you'll get destroyed in any type of an apologetic conversation with somebody that just says, well, that's how I was brought up. Well, you can be brought up and taught lies. Some of you are old enough now to realize that some of the things you were told growing up weren't the truth. Not just about religion, but about a variety of other things. So that's certainly possible. But the second 
reason that people will give is it sounds something like this. And this may even sound better to you from a defense standpoint at the outset. People will say, well, you know, I tried it and it works for me. Or I experienced it and my experience was a good one. And because I had a good experience with Jesus, or I had a good experience with the Bible, I think you should too. Good answer or bad answer? Terrible. Awful answer. Why? Because we leave ourselves open to any form of someone's experience. Do you know that people have some weird experiences that... When we leave it up to experience that just because it works for you or just because you enjoyed it or just because it was helpful, that that means that any mysticism, any religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam now has just as much authority as you do by your own reasoning. Because you said it worked for me. I liked it. It was a good experience. Anybody could give that answer and it's a terrible defense. So... Why do you trust the Bible? We've eliminated a couple of big reasons, but but let's just talk. The Baptist Faith and Message says this about the Bible. The Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of, uh, of divine instruction. It has God's for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All Scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. One of the reasons that I have been Southern Baptist and continue to affirm being Southern Baptist is because of their stance on Scripture. A little more, uh, a more simple definition than the one I just read you, but one that is fantastic and is worth memorizing is Vody Bauckham's definition to this answer or answer to the question, why should I trust the Bible? Vody Bauckham says, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report to us supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. It is a reason for why I trust the Bible. So let's just look at what the Bible says about itself. What does the Bible say about itself? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Old Testament, Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are flawless. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Back to the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. But let's talk about the testimony of men that wrote the New Testament. In fact, Inside it, we find the testimony of two apostles and one who was a close associate of one of the apostles. If we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, the apostle Peter is writing in his first letter and he says this, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love and with him I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it 
as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is the Apostle Peter's testimony about all of the apostles and their experience with Christ and that they wrote it down because they saw it with their their own eyes and it was eyewitnesses who could confirm what was seen by other eyewitnesses but if you'd like to look at another disciple's testimony another apostle's testimony then you would turn to first john first john chapter one the first four verses when john writes his epistle he says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we've looked at and our hands have touched do you remember that They touched the very hands of Jesus. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it. We testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. That is the testimony of the Apostle Peter. That's also the testimony of the Apostle John. And then you go to Luke. Luke was not an apostle, but he was a close associate with Paul and did the greatest investigative work in all of the New Testament. We just got through spending two years in the Gospel of Luke. And if you go to Luke's testimony, in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Now that took me a moment, but I think it was worth the time. When you look at the testimony of Scripture, the Old Testament about itself, the New Testament about both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the testimony of the apostles. In fact, we're going to look just a, in just a moment at the Apostle Paul himself and how he declares the Word of God to be Scripture, to be infallible, to be inerrant, to be inspired. So let's ask the question, as we move forward today, why is it that inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy are so important. Why are inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy so important? There are some people that may be thinking today, I mean, Larry, I believe the Bible. In fact, many people will say that they believe the Bible for faith and practice. You may have heard that term. That they believe the Bible in the principal doctrines it teaches. That they believe the Bible in all of the salvific ends that it has. But that doesn't mean that they have to believe every word of the Bible. Or they may say, I believe the Bible in what it teaches for the grand doctrines of the faith. But there are places in the Bible where I believe that there are mistakes. But that's not a big deal to me because I believe that in principle everything that it teaches is true. So I would ask you today, is inerrancy and infallibility, is the inspiration of Scripture every jot and tittle from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, is it important, is it theologically, doctrinally important that we believe that the Bible does not err? Is it theologically and doctrinally important that we believe that there are no mistakes in the Bible? Is it theologically and doctrinally important that you take it all, the whole? Or is it okay for you to believe most of the Bible? If you just had the thought, well, Larry... I think it's okay if we believe the major parts, that God created the world, that Jesus came to earth, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that he forgave sins. But there's a lot of things. I don't know if it's absolutely essential that we believe it in order to take the Bible. Then let me ask you this. Who gets to decide? You? That's arrogant. 
How prideful is it for me to say, well, I'm going to take some of the Bible, not all of it, and now I'm going to become the judge and jury of God's Word, and I'm going to pick and choose that which in the Bible I like and what I don't like. Do you know that that is where every major heresy throughout biblical history, throughout the time of all of the church, every history Every major heresy came from that. You look at Marcionism, the, one of the, and Gnosticism, one of the very first heresies that entered the New Testament. It's because people came in and pick and chose what they liked out of the Bible. It's the heresy that's happening today in the church is because people are picking and choosing which of the Bible they don't want. People say, I like grace, I hate wrath. Let's take the God of grace but get rid of the God of wrath. That's not new, that's 2,000 years old. That's Marcionism. He came along and said, let's get rid of the God of the Old Testament. I don't like him. He's vengeful. He's wrathful. He's judgeful and judging. And by the way, any parts of the New Testament that make him sound like that, let's get rid of that too. It's what you see today when people only preach a quote-unquote gospel that is health and wealth and prosperity. They only preach a God that all he wants to do is bless, 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 bless you. They preach a gospel in which you can have a prophetic word in your own mouth that you have authority more than the Bible does to be able to speak truth and positivity over your life it is heresy and it is because we have not been a people who have stood on the inerrancy infallibility and inspiration of not part of the bible but the whole of it because here's the question if you're not going to take all of scripture then how much is it okay for god to lie if god just lied in a couple of verses then what would that make him? It would make him a liar and it would invalidate every other part of it. You can't stake your eternity on a fallible revelation. It's inconceivable that a God who is perfect and holy and righteous would give us a book we can't trust. To disbelieve any of it is to disobey God. So whatever the Bible says about itself, about man, about God, about life, about death, about history, about science, about every other subject, it is true. J.I. Packer said, if I were the devil, one of my first aims would be to stop folk from digging into the Bible. Knowing that it is the Word of God, teaching men to know and love and serve the God of the Word, I should do all I could to surround it with the spiritual equivalent of pits, thorn hedges, and man traps to frighten people off. That's exactly what has happened. There's no good sermon without a good Spurgeon quote, so I want to give you one of my favorites. I would recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or else not to believe at all. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. There's no logical standing place between the two. Be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the deeps of divine revelation. A faith that paddles about the edge of the water is poor faith at best. It is little better than a dry land faith, and it's not good for much. John Calvin. We must not pick and call the scriptures to please our own fancy, but we must receive the whole without exception. So let me move to telling you why you can why you can say that you believe the Bible. And we're going to talk about the Old Testament first, and then we're going to talk about the New Testament. When we talk about the books that are in your Bible, it is 66 books. It is 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. That is known as the canon. The word canon originally mean read, meant read or measuring stick. You can think of it like when the early church fathers decided on what books would be contained in the canon. The measuring stick that was used was, was this the word of God? Was it written by people who were prophets of God or recorded by people who were close associates of prophets of God is it true and is it consistent with every other word of scripture and so when we look at the 39 books in the old testament we can be 100 percent certain that we have the word of God the old testament was written between 2400 AD and 3400 AD that's how old the Old Testament is. So a lot of people, when they hear that, they think, well, if the Old Testament is that old, is there any way that we can actually know that we have the right books? Is there any way that we can actually know that we have the right information? Because after all, all we have is copies anyway, right? 
You don't have a manuscript. You didn't walk in here with papyri or a scroll. Moses' actual hand did not touch the pages of the Bible that you brought or the electronic version that you came in with. So how can you know that the Bible that you hold is trustworthy? What would be held, decided to be held in the Old Testament was decided before the destruction of the temple in AD 70. But that's when it was made official. Even extra biblical testimony confirms that the 39 books of the Old Testament were confirmed as authoritative by or before the first century. The meticulous care of both the scribes who were Talmudists and the Masorites give an ironclad guarantee of textual reliability. The Talmudists, they lived from AD 100 to 500. I just want to give you a taste of how careful they were. For the people that tell you, oh, well, your Bible's full of mistakes. You ever heard that? Your Bible's full of mistakes. Here's what the Talmudists did. Each page, when they were copying, each page must have the same number of text columns at least 48 lines long, but no longer than 60 lines. Each line had to be 30 letters with perfect spacing. Nothing could be written from memory, and they had to use a specific type of ink. They took it so seriously that they had to wear a certain type of clothes, and they had to follow certain bathing rules. The Masorites, when they copied, they counted the number of words and letters in each book and also calculated the middle word and the middle letter of every single book of the Old Testament. They even knew the number of times each letter of the alphabet appeared in each book. So every time a copy was made, if the copy did not perfectly agree with the original, it was destroyed. And then in 1947, there was a major discovery. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you may have heard of them. They are dated to 125 B.C. 125 B.C. That is 1,025 years before the Masorites. Yet when they found the scrolls in the Dead Dead Sea Scrolls and compared them with both the Talmudist and the Masorites, we found that the copies that we have on Scripture are exactly what we had over 1,100 years before they were written, before these copies were made. So what I'm telling you is when people tell you, well, the Bible's full of mistakes, you know my first question? Where? Where? Because most people that say that don't have a clue what they're talking about. You say, tell me where these mistakes are. Now, there are some objections, and we could spend a long time talking about difficulties in the Bible. But every single objection, when you understand it from a literary, literary, scholarly standpoint, is easily understandable. It's absolutely explainable in every single way. In addition, there are numerous prophecies recorded sometimes hundreds of years in advance, that are fulfilled in minute detail. What about archaeology? Archaeology further proves the Bible's reliability. There has not been one archaeological discovery, not one, that has ever controverted a single biblical statement, but instead... Archaeology has confirmed the cities of the Bible, the rivers of the Bible, the people groups of the Bible, the customs of the Bible, the mountain ranges in the Bible, and the practices that are mentioned in the Old Testament. If that's the only fact I gave you was archaeological proof and said, I'm done and sat down, that fact alone would separate the biblical text from every single other religion. Not one other religion has a holy book, quote unquote, that you can confirm archaeologically anything in the book. There are some things, but every one of them has been proven wrong archaeologically on fact upon fact, city upon city. Do you know that some of them, they can't even find mountain ranges that are mentioned? I think you could find a mountain range. I'm no archaeologist, but I mean, I can find the Colorado Rockies. Seems like that'd be a tough miss. So the Old Testament is verifiable, but what about the New Testament canon? What about the 27 books we have in the New Testament? How do we know we have the right ones? 
I mean, after the Da Vinci Code and all of that, people have said, what about the Gospel of Thomas and all these other writings? Uh, How do we know that the books we have are actually the books that we're supposed to have? First century Christians saw in the words of Jesus and the writings of the apostles and the authority of divine inspiration equaling that of the Old Testament scriptures. So when it comes to the books in the New Testament, we have more than 5,800 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. 5,800 Greek copies of the New Testament. You say, well, Larry, does, does that really make it verifiable? Let's talk about one example uh, dating to around the time of the New Testament. The best preserved ancient document besides the New Testament is something called the Iliad. You may have heard of it. It has less than 13% of the evidence that the New Testament has, and it's number two on the list. In addition, there is less than a 25-year time span between the date of the New Testament events, when they were written, and the date of the earliest copy is only 100 years from the event. Let me tell you what, why that's important. The people that are writing the New Testament are all connected to the events of the New Testament. They were either there as John was, they were either there as Paul was, they were there as Peter was, or they are taking notes directly from the people who were there. Not one single New Testament book is written more than 25 years away from the events that they described. And then, not only that, But every single, even our earliest copies, date within 100 years. So the people that wrote the copies could actually be connected back to the actual apostles themselves. You're not more than two generations removed from the actual people who wrote and confirmed the events. There is no ancient history confirmed like the Bible is confirmed. Also, the history, geography, and cultural components of the events and places mentioned in the New Testament and verify which separates it from all other religious texts as well. Notice when you're reading the book of Acts, you read about rulers and you read about cities and you read about places and you read about times. All of it verified. Now, if you're going to make up a fable or a legend, you can't try to place the fable and the legend and use times and places and dates and people that are not also true because you would leave it up for people to be able to verify it which is one of the reasons why we know the new testament is absolutely the truth because it was written in a time where if they had gotten it wrong everyone would have known they had gotten it wrong you following me it wasn't that they wrote it 300 years later and nobody knew what was going on back then they wrote it when the events were actually taking place so people reading the book would never have accepted it if they didn't also know oh yeah i know herod was the king yeah pontius pilate he was the ruler absolutely our felix absolutely this was all part of the vernacular of the day and was easily disputable if you couldn't verify Think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that there were 500 witnesses of the resurrection, most of whom, Paul said, were still alive when he was writing to to the church in Corinth. So what Paul is saying is, is that there were 500 people that saw it, most of whom, so we got over 250 of them at the very least because it's most of them are still alive what's Paul saying he's saying when you read this go check with them there are living witnesses that are still alive today that saw the events take place because they're verifiable you can't spread lies with that many living witnesses in fact Not only could you not spread lies, but your children and your grandchildren couldn't spread lies because there would still be people who would be connected to the event. But some people have said, and I guess you've heard this as well, well, the Bible is just a product of several centuries later, there were some people or some monks or some religious folks that wanted to establish some doctrines, so they went back and they changed it all. And they just put in the Bible what they wanted to put into the Bible to the exclusion of other things and made the Bible say what they wanted it to say. Have you ever heard an argument that sounded something like that? 
That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And people sound smart. Like Sometimes they, they sound real highbrowed when they're coming against the Bible, but if they knew how ignorant they actually were, they'd keep their mouth closed. And here's why. How many did I tell you? How many manuscripts? 58. Some of you aren't listening. 5,800. All right? So, if I was going to go back and alter the New Testament hundreds of years, what would I have to do? I'd have to alter all of them. Right? Because the way textual criticism, that's how people compare what is in the Bible to see about the manuscripts. You take all 5,800 manuscripts and you compare them together. So for someone hundreds of years later, they would have had to somehow had the ability to find all 5,800 manuscripts. Find them. That'd be a miracle, right? I've got to find all 5,800. But then I've got to dig them up. And then hundreds of years later, I've got to take the document and I've got to change all the wording in the document. But I've got to make it look like I didn't change all the wording in the document. I've got to make it look like it actually happened hundreds of years before. And then I've got to seal up the document. I've got to place it back where I found it. I've got to make it look like... I've got to make it look like that it wasn't ever changed or altered. And then I've got to move away from that. And I've never got to mention a word of it to any of the people that are around me that that actually happened. So that when they find them, they will be verifiable when they look at it. It's absolutely impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And by the way, they wouldn't have just needed to do that in Greek. It was the New Testament manuscripts were copied in three different languages. You say, well, wait a minute, Larry. I mean, I mean, I guess that could have happened, could it? Because the early church fathers wrote so much commentary on the New Testament that you can actually write the entire New Testament just from the commentary of the early church fathers, the first three centuries of the church, the first 300 years, the early church fathers. They wrote so much biblical commentary that you can actually write the whole New Testament from the commentary of the early church fathers. So they would have also had to break into the libraries of every early church father and every place and change not only the manuscripts, but they would have had to have changed... <laughs> Idiots. You'd have had to change all of the commentary as well. And by the way, if you were going to change something, if you were going to change something, why would you include such embarrassing details about many of the apostles? Supposedly some of the monks that did this were Catholic. And if, according to Catholic doctrine, Peter is their first pope, why would you have gone back and chosen information that made your quote-unquote pope look so bad? They wouldn't have done that. They won't do it now, much less then. It is proof. It is proof. But I want to hit a couple of common objections couple of common objections. Oh, it's just written by men. Men wrote that. Men wrote that. True or false, men had a hand in writing the Bible. True. I don't have a lot of time left, but we believe in, in what is called the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. That means that they, every word is 100% inspired, but that God used men he used their intellect and used their personality. That's why when you read Luke, why it doesn't sound like Paul. And that's when you read Paul, why it doesn't sound like David in the Psalms. Because they, their personality certainly came out. But just because men were used in write, writing it doesn't mean it's not reliable. It doesn't mean it's not consistent. It doesn't mean it's not corroborated. Think about this. Just, just, just this point alone. Just this point alone why I believe the Bible. You know how many languages the Bible was written in? Three, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, all right? So if the Bible's written in three languages, you know what? how many continents the Bible was written on? Three, Asia, Africa, and Europe. 
So the Bible is written in three different languages on three different continents by 40 different authors. By the way, most of them didn't know each other. Three languages, three continents, 40 authors, most of whom didn't know each other. Over 1,500 years is how long it took to, read the, to, to write the Bible. Now, if you were to take all of that, three continents, three languages, 1,500 years, and you place it together in a book, how foolish do you have to be to believe that this is an accident when it tells one redemptive singular story? You almost could believe in evolution before you could believe in that. How much would it take to be able to do that? But then people say this, and this is the most ridiculous objection of all of them, and then, then, then we'll be done. But Larry, you can't prove the Bible scientifically. I hear that sometimes from people that are scientists. All right, let's lose, use your logic. We'll, just, we'll allow you to use your logic. You can't prove it scientifically. What's the scientific method? What is the scientific method? If you're going to do something scientifically, what has to happen? It has to be observable. It has to be measurable. And it has to be repeatable. So can you use the scientific method with the Bible? No. No. Some of you are going, oh no, oh no. He just admitted we can't use a scientific method with the Bible. By that reasoning, we need to absolutely quit ever having court again. Because you don't prove everything by a scientific method. And by the way, every bit of history that you now know, you have to throw it out. How do I know that? Because you can't observe George Washington being pre president. You can't repeat George Washington being president. History is not part of the scientific method, but that doesn't mean it's not verifiable because it is like a court case. And when you take the Bible and you examine it based on the history, based on the evidence, based on the support, what happens is the Bible has been found guilty. Guilty? Yes. Guilty of being 100% authoritative on everything it says. Every jot, every tittle, Genesis to Revelation, all of it, both the doctrinal stances and the details, everything that the Bible teaches, it means that it is 100%. And the reason this message is absolutely essential for your life is because if that's the case, then you ought to believe it. If it's the case, then you ought to read it. And if it's the case... You ought to obey it because it has 100% authority over who you are. The reason that we know to bow our knee before the God of Scripture is because we've been revealed by His great love in the greatest love letter that's ever been written to tell you how your soul can be redeemed. Would you pray with me?